Hey everyone, I'm Alex Elmore, and this is the Who Knew Sports Podcast. Today we are staying across the pond, and we are going to Ireland, and we interviewed Patrick O'Regan this morning. He is the CEO and founder of Reach the Top, which their objective is to sell uh, this software that he and his crew created that is a uh, it is a cr recruitment software for athletes and you know the uh, organization uh, elite organizations like you know NCAA or you know any of the big like pro teams out there and basically what it does is it sets up you know athletes with you know the uh, organizations and the organiza organizations can find you know the specific athlete that they want and it also for the athletes it connects them with different uh kind of not sports organizations to you know make money you know with all the new nil uh, laws that came out they're able to make money now and this is what he does um very interesting guy he grew his company uh during covid and it's very interesting to hear how he did it and you know some of the principles that he follows within his organization so please listen you will enjoy this and see ya. So, Patrick, good morning. Hey, Alex, how are you? Great to meet you. Uh, good to meet you, too. Uh, you're from Ireland, right? Yeah, exactly right from Ireland, uh, County Kerry, rural Ireland, southwest. Oh, wow. Um, so, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess my first question for you is, you know, what, what is everything that you do? Like, what is, what is your everyday activities? Yeah, so basically we have a, a fake until we make it kind of mentality here at Reach the <laughs> Top. Um, but essentially what we do, Alex, is we are the Moneyball software for all sports teams. That we're trying to give uh, elite teams access to a platform that will get them the best talent ahead of rivals. So what does that mean for us? Uh, so we're currently in a kind of a startup scale-up growth phase. Um, so my kind of day-to-day -day is managing the development team, um, doing fundraising activities for the development of our business and sales. So it's managing, we have a two-person sale team. So it's managing that and it's, you know, I'm wearing multiple hats at the moment, but it's it's a great experience what we're trying to do. You know, no two days are, no two days are ever the same inside here. So you, okay, so you're trying, so your, your job specifically is kind of raising money for your company, correct? Well, it's more than that. So at the moment we've, we're doing a chunky enough seed round uh, for our business and we've done very well raising that money. Um, so what I'm responsible so is the day-to-day -day activities in the sense of selling the product, getting on to, you know, elite sporting teams, having good, you know, sales conversations, promoting the product. Um, but more than often at the moment where we are in this company, um, we're, <laughs> I have to wear multiple hats. So I'm in with managing the the development team so it's uh it's helter skelter alex but it's uh it's fun uh, it's fun there's a lot of headaches but that's all <laughs> that's all expected you know when you when you're at this stage of a business okay so that the software that you provide to it's a software right yeah yeah it's a software okay, okay. Uh, you provide that to teams and what is what do they see from their end yeah so basically what they'll have <laughs> Um, okay, so a little bit more clarification on the software. So what we do is kind of, we are a full end-to-end -end management system. Um, we're starting off in the NCAA because it's, you know, if it works in the NCAA yeah. lucrative market, it's really scalable and extensible to other facets of sport. Right. So essentially college, they're, they're looking for an athlete. Let's take basketball, for example. You're looking for a pass first point guard, shoots the ball at a high clip in the corner. Uh, with our video analysis software, and our algorithm, we will generate the best, let's say Duke University wants it there, we'll generate the best point guard that suits their team system. And this is done through breaking down video footage. So you want that pass first point guard who plays on a five out offense, bang, we will generate those athletes to suit you. But then even from, from a college perspective then, so we do the day-to-day -day management. So like team communications, we do all their team communications work from scheduling, you know, training sessions, carry logs, all the, the boring compliance stuff. We take that all off their hands, put it on our system. Um, and then from an athlete's perspective, Alex, what we're doing as well is, you know, you've seen the, the new legislative act for the first time ever. 
the, the nil policy allowing athletes to make money. Yeah. Um, so we empower athletes to take control, not just of the recruitment journey and try to get in front of colleges, but also monetize their brand. Um, and we connect, our algorithm will connect them with the, the right brands that suits their, um, you know, their CSR, the corporate social responsibility needs, um, and the same for companies. So we kind of have a, a, a lot of attack angles there, revenue streams in our business. Yeah, that sounds like everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, so, you know, because yeah. it, it is scalable into other sports, but there is huge synergy at the moment between the nil policy and, you know, the recruitment, because in theory, a, co- a D3 college now could attract the next LeBron James if they have, a, you know, a program in place that's going to help those athletes get paid. So that's where we come in and we tell colleges, you know, don't you worry about your nil policy. We'll make sure that those athletes are going to be compliant with a policy we'll craft for you mm-hmm. and they can only do deals that suit your nil policy. Whilst at the same time, those athletes, they're lining their pockets. Um, that, that's the way we're looking at it. Okay. So how many, so what's your athlete to, uh, organization ratio? So at the moment, our athlete to organization ratio is quite small because of where we are. We've, we were trying to find our feet in the marketplace for a long time in the sense that we, we didn't know where to start. We knew this, we validated the market through speaking to elite teams, both in the NCAA, both in European soccer, even in, you know, EuroLeague basketball. Um, but we've seen that it was very, it was hard to really find our feet and say, okay, this is where we're going to start. So, I mean, you see the numbers there, there's 50,000 elite sporting teams out there. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we're trying to do is, you know, get a tiny fraction of that market, but it took us a long time to realize, you know, we have to start somewhere. So where is it somewhere to start? We we're starting in the NCAA high school. So our kind of sales process here, Alex, is a, it's a B2B sale in the sense that we're targeting high schools and academies um, to get their athletes into our system because, mm-hmm. you know, if they get athletes to, you know, the Dukes of the world, the fucking K- Kentuckys, you know, it's a conveyor belt inside there, there for those high schools in the sense that they'll get more endowment money and, you know, money for their programs. So where we are at the moment, we are in, Jesus, I mean, it's cracking me up. We're, we're getting sales calls, really extensive, uh, really big colleges. Uh, it's the mm. 1% of colleges we're speaking to at the moment, um, which, you know, I'm actually, you know, for running an organization like this, it, it's super exciting to be able to talk to, you know, the, the logos you want to see on your website, essentially, without going into too much detail on them. Yeah. Um, so that's where we are. Like, we have great feedback from the athletes that we have on the system. It's just pushing, pushing the boat forward. Um, cause I think I'm saying to you, one of the, one of the messages we exchange, it's, you know, it's, it is that fake until you make it mentality. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of did things, we kind of did things backwards. And what I mean is, um, there is a great, there is a great need for the product from what we've seen from market research. So we presented a very compelling PowerPoint and business case, um, to investors and, we got investment money and then, you know, we were thinking, okay, now let's go build a product. Where does it sit? If I was <laughs> to go back, if I was to go back, you know, if today was yesterday, I'd be saying, okay, build the fecking product and then we'll get the investment. So we did it, as I, as I say here, you know, we did it back ways, but you know, it's a learning curve, but we're really, we're seeing a lot of momentum picking up now. So it, it, it is quite exciting. Yeah. I, it does seem really exciting. Um, so how many, so how many colleges do you have right now exactly, e- or an estimate? Yeah, right now we have about two colleges. Maybe we have two, should I say, not about two. So yeah, okay. that's, that's where we're going. Um, but then even like the sales cycle that we have, Alex, it's, it's just, with these colleges, it's anywhere between three to six months. So you can have a good conversation with them, but okay. this time of the year as well, with, like we're starting basketball. So, you know, you have the season, you have the preseason games coming in, we're, you know, the games are coming thick, thick and fast here. Yeah. So it's hard. You might have a productive conversation, you know, with the graduate assistant or with, um, you know, with the assistant coach. And then all of a sudden, bang, it's, you know, it's lost for, for weeks. So it is kind of um, an enterprise sales cycle. But we are very fortunate that on our advisory board, we have some really experienced um, NCAA coaches before we've one guy without naming names but we've one guy who was a winning record in American football basketball track and field and golf um it's mad <laughs> it's mad when you get speaking to this guy you're thinking oh my god how does he you know how is this coaching skills in basketball transferable to golf 
but as he'll tell you you know it's it's people at the end of the day that's what coaching is but he's he's been fantastic opening doors so we are very lucky in that sense if i had to guess he's probably not a division one coach because they all probably separate on that that's probably like a division three or two yeah division right? yeah he was he was assistant coach in d1 for a while in basketball then he found his feet in d2 d3 all right so um you did also talk about like other like big uh soccer teams or football teams yeah uh are those you know are there a lot of them with your uh, program yeah so what we're doing at the moment is we had a vision going a scattergun approach but if we go scattergun approach you really dilute your core offering because you know you're jack of all trades and master of none yeah so our growth plan for the next year is folks on the ncaa get a few of those colleges under our belt i mean our sweet spot before we expand to other sports is about 25 colleges that's what we're looking for i think 25 colleges out of you know there's an average 15 sporting departments and you know in 100 1433 colleges so there's 21,000 plus customers uh, in the ncaa all we're looking for is 25 if you get 25 the model our business model is proved and we can begin scaling into soccer clubs so in terms of soccer clubs we've had i mean it is really interesting um like even uh, your small european soccer clubs like the like league of ireland uh mm-hmm. league two in england like the money is very small in those clubs and it's frightening when you're talking to these people at the end of the phone and you know they have two sets of jerseys for the whole year. You know, you keep, if you're, if you're there center forward, you have your home and away kit and because teams don't have the money to finance that. So that's right. where we're hoping that our nil offering would be scalable and helping those teams monetize on the back of those players, allowing their players to monetize themselves as well. So it's, it's exciting, Alex, to be honest, but it's, uh, it is a slow burn at the moment, but I, I wouldn't change it for anything. Uh, it seems like, you guys are on the right path. It, it seems very interesting. So um, I guess more about you real quick. How did you get to the position that you are right now? So in, in terms of that question, just in terms of like a little bit about, about me and how I found my feet inside this. Yeah. Okay. So basically I, years ago uh, and about when I was 15, 16, I was always obsessed with basketball stats, always obsessed, Um, loved coaching, but I was always thinking that, you know, there's more than meets the eye than how many times you put a ball in the basket because you could be lit up like a Christmas tree at defense. But if, you know, if you're just scoring the ball, yeah, you look great, but you're not contributing to the whole team. So that just always played in my mind that, okay, like if I was ever to go into, you know, my own business, it would be something along this, you know, money ball philosophy. Uh, So, a little bit about that. So in 2015, had this inceptional idea of reach the top, got to a business final in a young entrepreneur program in Ireland. But like any good Irish family, if you're not like a teacher, nurse, doctor, or a priest, forget it. You haven't accomplished anything. Uh, so <laughs> I, I focused on studies, parked that at the back of my mind, focused on studies, went to college, uh, did English and history, thought I was going to become a teacher. Uh, parked that because I got very lucky. Um, I got very lucky in the sense that, you know, I worked a few jobs that I didn't like. Uh, you know, it wasn't me. And I, it was, you know what, looking back at now, it was a great learning curve. That mm. so young, you know, 22, 23, knowing, fuck's sake, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. It was a great learning curve. And sometimes the, that's the point of jobs, just, or anything really. If you don't like it, you learn something from it because you, that's you it. don't like it. Yeah. That's it, exactly. And I think what I learned there is, you know, you have to know your worth and there's no point being miserable having no work-life balance and, you know, having, yeah, like money is great at the end of the day, but, you know, you can't accomplish a lot if you're not happy. If you're, you know, if you're bored, sick in your job, you're mentally ruined. But I was very fortunate then that I fell into company as an enterprise project manager, working with some, like, implementing software for some of the world's biggest company um so i was really fortunate with that and that was kind of in a really startup scale up mindset and i was thinking jesus if these guys from cork in ireland can have the biggest companies in the world in it i could do it and not because you know i didn't think i was better than them, but just the learnings i got from that company was mm. fantastic so then in the middle of covid um, i found myself bored in the evenings when you're in lockdown and there was this business incubator being ran by university college cork called ignite so i said i'll apply for that got into it 
really validated the product over you know 12 months uh at the back of that then i actually won best overall business and that really expediated my business journey um i'm at this full time the last six months giving up my job as project manager but these six months i've learned so much i mean it's kind of sink or swim mm -hmm. mentality i didn't like in my wildest dreams i didn't think that you know we'd have a team of, of four developers working on it so two sales guys never did i think that i thought that reach a top would be you know a side hustle at best but i just found myself very fortuitous to be in this opportunity and it all comes from that learning curve because one day i just thought look i gotta bite the bullet i'm, I'm you know young i don't want to be that guy in the pub that we see you know in ireland that oh if i did this you know 20 years ago you know that could have been me me in that situation i didn't want that so that's that's where we came at reach the top i said we'll go you know hell hell for leather get into it and see mm -hmm. what happens um because one of my really good business mentors and someone i really look up to he his name is Eamon Curtin and ignite but he always said to us that the one thing if you're going to start a business the worst that can happen is nothing and when you're sitting on the seat listening to him you're thinking yeah you know what's this guy talking about you know my business is going to fail but like at the end of the day you know just because your business fails it's still nothing you can still go back into the big bad world work the nine to five so right. I just think that mindset that the worst that can happen is nothing obviously you know I think it was for me, it was getting between, I was between a rock and a hard place, I suppose, in terms of, I knew I wanted to go full-time in this, but I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, and it was just taking that step. I think hearing that a few times from him really resonated with me. And it was literally, you know, it was like I'm top of the diving board there and just wanting to jump. And it was, you know, what's going to happen? Absolutely nothing. So that's, that's my mentality now. That brought me to where I am. I gave a kind of a roundabout answer there, but that's, that's where we are at reach the top at the moment. That's awesome. So you're you've kind of perfected of selling your company, correct? Or, yeah. Yeah. So how did you how did you learn to, you know, to sell? You know, how did you learn to uh, really promote your company as best as as the best as you can? Yeah, that's very interesting because like, I think I'm a real people's person. I hate being on zoom calls you know like i'd much rather do anything like this face to face because i yeah. think selling you can be so disingenuous behind a computer screen um especially in this like the landscape that i'm in you know selling to college coaches they want to be wined and dined so mm -hmm. it's just hard it's a hard mentality but where i learned my sales is jesus it's you know it's just being with people people skills if you're good at people and have a nice way about you and you can show that you're genuine you can sell anything uh, it's that you know people buy from people you know we're not buying from robots um like there's a great scene in the office i just think when anytime we think of selling i think of when michael and dwight go in you know when they separate they go into this guy they're trying to sell to and dwight gets all the names mixed up and he says all the wrong things and then michael knew exactly what to say he knew your man's children and that's the thing like you know people buy from children i know it's a random analogy to compare to the office but yeah point of the story is the person that michael scott was selling to michael scott knew his children if you knew, get really personable and authentic with someone it's hard not to i'm not saying that geez i'm going down yeah. through the family tree and doing all that lineage but for me it's you know it's just being good to people and being authentic people are going to say no and it's not like for me what's key i've got so many people that said no to me and it's the learning curve it's someone tells me no okay it's why won't you buy my product what can i do to improve and take that feedback on board like maybe it was like for example you were too aggressive in your sales pitch okay let's mellow that back a little bit or you know we're going with you know company x because they do a b and c and then you just add it to the product roadmap it's mm. it's a learning curve the whole time and i suppose where else did i learn it from is <laughs> i was uh i'm obsessed with shoes i was got a job in nike um when i was younger and i was you know selling pegasus shoes and telling them the history of you know steve prefontaine and how the first runner of all time was the air waffle or you know it was all that kind of story and i just loved that idea um so that that for me was a great learning curve you know between 16 to 19 when i was kind of in my first few years of college doing that it was massive to the learning experience and what i find as well is you know is reading i mean you can you can read all the books in the world but it, you know what did mike tyson say you don't know how hard someone punches you until they hit you in the face so 
yeah, I love reading the books. I found that has given me a great arsenal of, of tools to be able to sell. But when it comes down to it, then at the end of the day, sometimes the books go out the window on that learning curve. But it's something I would live by is, you know, per- being personable and reading books and learning. It's, that's what it is. It's, everything is a learning curve in this process. It's actually interesting that you brought up reading. I just met with Jeff Wilson. Uh, oh, very yeah. good, yeah. And he, his, his two things are networking and also reading. So, yeah. That's, yeah, the other thing I would say is, like, not even in the sales game, but what I found so far in my business journey is networking. It's absolutely amazing. And I think, like, being in Ireland here, we are really fortunate that, you know, we're kind of, so linked to Europe and America, where that you know that bridge that people are crossing. But it's just when you get speaking to someone, it's just amazing the contacts that they have. And like what I did at the start, I was trying to pick like on LinkedIn, I'd pick ten people every week and try to get three detailed conversations with out of those ten. And it was just fascinating. Like you know, I mightn't have got every week. Like I mightn't have three hours of conversations. It actually ended up that, you know, I might exchange 50 messages with all, with all 10 of them. It's that hit rate. But like, it's just once you get them on a phone, then it's it's amazing of how receptive people are, you know, to, to startups like my journey. And, you know, the learn like any advice that they dispense is absolute gold dust because these people have been there, done that. They can open the doors. I just find it. It is fascinating. Yeah. Who told you about the, uh, you know, 10 uh, ask 10 people and try to get three good uh, responses going. That was just me. That's just number ahead of my mind, my mindset, because I was just thinking, this is me being kind of sales focused here. Yeah. I'm thinking, okay, if you can send it to 10 and, you know, if three of them at the end of the day, like, okay, like five reply and you got, you know, three people, you have a 60% conversion rate. And I'm thinking, okay, yeah, that'd be great. Let's just get three people. But that's the way I just looked at it um, because with my diary as well and schedule, I was like, okay, if I had a call every day, you know, you could look busy, but, you're not being productive because it's taken away from the business. So that's why I was kind of like, you know, kind of, I kind of put a Friday in my diary that we'd say from uh, one o'clock to four o'clock, that's a time I network and do all, you know, smaller business activities. If I don't have calls there. Do you know who Brian Clapp is? Brian Clapp. Yeah. Uh, He's over here. Uh, So anyways, my uh, professor and him, uh, they kind of work together and they, and he put together a um, four modules for us to like learn, you know, about the sports industry. And he said the exact same thing about the 10 people and trying to get three, three good conversations out of them, like exactly the same. Did he have any reason to why he was three people? I, I forget what he said on the module. Uh, I, I, I just watched it too. So I shouldn't forget that, but I think it was just like, if you could get one to three, you, you, you are doing a great job networking. And that, that, I think that was the reasoning, which is, uh, I don't know. I think it's, it's funny that you don't even know him and you said the exact same thing. Yeah. It's just something I think, you know, as yeah. people, we get, we get these numbers in our heads as well that we just go with. And I just think for me, that was it. I just told yeah. myself, geez, if I get three people, or maybe I seen it in a book sometime and it just subliminally went into my head and I have this magic number. Um, but no, that, it, that's very interesting. I must look up this Brian Clapp person after the call. Oh, yeah. He, he's a great person to talk to. He's very knowledgeable about the sports industry. Um, kind of a little bit off topic, but yep. uh, I'll tie it in. You talked about Michael Scott earlier. And, you know, <laughs> I, it's, he, what an interesting personality. But, however, in the show, it kind of goes over, like, how he secretly kind of has some good management skills, how he's secretly a good, like, you know, good seller of his, you know, company or not the company, his branch. But my, my question for you is what do you think are some good management skills on your part? Oh, I think again, it all comes down to it's people skills. And mm-hmm. I mean, you got to know people. I find it once you get a common ground that you can relate to, um, it's key. Like even with the, the development team I have now, there are fantastic individuals um, with the sales guy as well. It's fantastic, but you got to know what makes them tick and being able to incentivize them. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of people take the stance that, you know, you can't be too friendly with your staff, you know, kind of separation of powers idea. 
I do agree with that, but I think a lot of it too is, you know, you really got to go. I think Greg Popovich is, you know, you're talking about management skills. He is just the pinnacle of it. I mean, you know, all the all his players speak so highly of him. Like Boris Diaw said recently that, you know, he couldn't get over how Pop would know everything about the family. And I think, you know, when you're creating a business or, you know, a company ethos culture, it really is important that, you know, it's not the customer that's put on the, you know, the pendulum inside here that you hinge everything off. It's actually, but I'm finding it, it's the person who's working for you because if they're happy, you know, it's going to be a productive company. And what I'm finding, is it's just knowing what makes these people tick and it's the why, it's their motive. Why are they working for us? Okay. Is it money? Okay. If it's not money, okay. They believe in a vision. And I think that, you know, that's powerful. I'm, I want to come in, my company, like what we want to do is, you know, obviously provide a great atmosphere in terms of, you know, career opportunities, career path, but it's also that vision. And it, you don't get to that vision, you know, unless you get to know that person. That's mm-hmm. what I'm finding. So it has to be really personable. That's honestly great to hear. Um, so you talked about uh, how you kind of built your company during COVID, correct? Yeah. That must have been hard. Tell me, can you go a little bit more in the detail about <laughs> yeah. that? So I, where I was with my, I suppose, I'm going to say my work career. I was there. I was loving what I was doing. I was working with Fortune 500 companies and the pay was fantastic. You know, at 24 and you're getting paid this, you're thinking, oh my God, you know, I want more of this. You want to climb the corporate ladder. But then when COVID hit, I was thinking, you know, it's now a prime opportunity because you know recruitment is at a standstill because we're as scouts you know you want to go to as much games as you can but how can you do that but then in COVID like you know obviously I didn't have the the financial backing as I do today to be able to put myself in a position to go full-time on my business so again what I found during COVID how I really built this was working smarter not harder Mm -hmm. Um, and I think for the first like up till July I was able to manage you know, the two, the two entities, my personal life and my business um, together. And I found what was really good is surrounding myself with, with the right people. And that has really been imperative to where I am now. And like, it was a slog, you know, to get reset, like even to validate the product, you know, getting people on the phone saying, okay, is this going to be, you know, is this going to be a viable option, viable business? And yeah, like, you I mean, by the time, because they were sick of working at home too, when, you know, you were thinking, will I ever get a response? It is hard, but I think for me, it was COVID. Everyone was on the same boat. And it's just having the mentality that, look, I think I said it earlier, like, you know, just because someone says no, it's just on to the next one. It's being that resilient. And even with COVID, it comes back as well to the company that I was working for. They started in 2008 in the midst of a huge recession globally. And their business grew and grew each year. They especially took off in the recession. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just thought like, you know, okay, is there any similarities to them that I could, you know, follow a blueprint, even though they're in environmental health and safety software, I'm in sports tech, is there any similarities? And, you know, just got on the phone with the, the CEO and the, the CEO one day and just said, look, how would I go about doing this in the midst of COVID, in the midst of, you know, I'm going to say economic doom and gloom at one stage. Um, how would I go about it? And it was just keep plugging away, keep chugging away like a train on the train tracks and I'm thinking do you know it does make sense I am giving you a very political answer but that's what I found is just day by day whittling away that tree um and look that's where I am today I whittle down enough tree uh I'm on to a next tree and that that's the way I'm going just that one percent mindset every day accomplishing something I also as well it sounds random but I would prioritize a lot of tasks like, even when I was working so that for me was really key to to where I find myself in now so I, I think it's really, that, that's the first time I've heard someone like you, you perfectly knew where to go to when building your company, like trying to get advice. You went to someone who built their company through a recession. I think that's really smart. Like you, like you said, you worked smarter, not harder during that time. And I think that's probably the smartest thing anyone could have done during that time is you know, if you're building your company, definitely go through someone who has also built their company through a, you know, a recession, but that's awesome. Um, 
So I guess, uh, do you, what, what is your biggest kind of like thing that you have learned so far during this time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> how much time do you have? Um, I got time. I got plenty of it. <laughs> like, I think for me, we say business aside, from what I learned so far, like, I mean, it's, it's happiness is key. I mean, you don't want to be stuck in a, you know, a nine to five dead end job. You're not going anywhere. And it's cutting ties with that as quick as you can. Uh, and it's finding that something that's going to create that spark for you. And for mm. me, I was lucky enough. That was, you know, I got into that startup mindset company who grew in, grew in the midst of a recession, learned from them. And then that gave me the, the spark to pursue, reach the top. Mm. But like to get back to that, Alex, like, I just think, oh, I mean, it's people skills. It's being, oh, if today was yesterday, I would be a lot tougher in some of the, you know, the deals that I've done mm-hmm. and some of the conversations I had. And, you know, I think that's what it is. It's just knowing your worth, as I said at the start. From a personal perspective, if I was in a nine to five job, yeah, I'd have no problem knowing my worth. But then when it comes into the business standpoint and where I am now at the moment, yeah, I know my worth, but it took me, Jesus it took me 18 months to know, okay, this is what the business is worth. This is what, you know, your time is worth, your valuation is worth, you know, just because someone is offering you a truckload of money, don't say, oh, you know, let's jump on it. So that for me, oh, if today was yesterday, I think uh, my, my company would be a lot, you know, not that I'm regretful of anyone who, you know, who, who's in this journey, but I would rather be a little bit hard nosed. Um, and that's the one thing I'd say is just knowing thy worth, both in a personal setting and, you know, in the business setting. Okay, so you talk about, yeah, knowing your worth is definitely important. And you probably, you learned that through COVID, correct? Mostly, or with that company that you were working with? Yeah, so I learned it from, I think it would have been a lot easier if it was, as I said, for face-to-face meetings. Mm. I just think that, you know, like when you're negotiating, you know, the fine art, it's nice to be able to do it in, I want to say, a casual setting in the sense that you can see the reaction of the person in front of you not leaving it down to, you know, text messages, to voice notes. You want to be that genuine and create that sense of authenticity. Uh, Like I did find that, you know, COVID did throw a huge spanner in the works for all that kind of things. But having said that, for all the the things I learned during COVID, COVID has made the world so small. Like, I mean, who would have thought, you know, me and and Kerry to be talking to you, you know, all the way over in the States then. That comes down to, you know, LinkedIn, it's the power of, you know, the world has gotten so much smaller because of COVID. Um, but like, I think for me, it was just, I think I was jumping straight in instead of negotiating harder. That was my point. And, I, you know, I looking back on it then, you know, you see deals on the table, you see, you know, whatever you signed with various people and you're thinking, okay, yeah, maybe if I was a little bit harder here, this would have benefited both parties better. Um, and I think for me, like COVID or no COVID, it was just finding my feet in that journey, in that knowing thy worth kind of a scenario. Uh, ha- are you aware of what the great resignation is? Have you heard about that? No, but please. <laughs> check okay. out. Well, it basically during, you know, time of COVID, uh, people have been resigning from their jobs and it's because you're unhappy with where, you know, they're working, whether it's because of like the environment or their, uh, are they just aren't satisfied with the job that they're doing. So a lot of people have been doing that. I, I think that's kind of, you kind of touched on that, right? Yeah. I think for me and my point, like I was unhappy with, oh, you know, I had this miserable job, you know, it was a sales job and it was, you were just a number, you weren't a person. And, yeah. you know, you don't want to work hard. You're just a number. It's, you know, did you hit your sales quota flipping, ham- hammering the phones till you got, you know, a hundred responses today. And that isn't good. And then like what I found is in COVID, I mean, if I wasn't in this business now, I'd be, I would happily still be in that job of that project manager because it was such a great environment to learn. And you weren't a number. You were a person like the CEO and the CEO really cared of, you know, what were you doing at the weekend? They really wanted to know, like, did you, you know, did you shoot your best round of golf ever? Or, you know, could you, could your swing do a change? That's the kind of management that they went to. So for me during COVID, I think they actually, I was so lucky that they actually pushed me in the right direction. The challenge me as an individual to actually take the step. 
you know, take okay. that plunge. And they, you know, they said, look, we are a safety net. If you ever need it, we're here. So I had that support by them. I think, I mean, I alluded to you, to you in a message. Like, I was so privileged to have that opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know, that safety net. But, like, I mean, in terms of great resignation, there's some jobs I went through that great resignation stage, you know, mm-hmm. knowing I weren't thinking, oh, my God, you know, get me out of here ASAP. Okay. So has for the people that work for you were they yeah. were they kind of in that position where they kind of needed to get out of their current job or was it kind of their or is this more of an entry level for them um more of an entry level no okay. there is one there is one uh there is one guy um who he actually went back studying through COVID. um he was okay. highly qualified went back studying um and he just wanted you know literally a gig that he can feel fulfilled and I'm going to say warranted, you know, that showed him that we need him. And that's exactly what we did. You know, he couldn't pick up the phone at a better stage to ask what we're doing um, because I needed someone. And this guy is being an immense help to the company in terms of, you know, generating leads, getting, you know, getting on sales calls. It has been fantastic, but we were lucky that it was more, you know, entry level and, you know, they weren't forced out of that. All right. I do have one last question for you, Patrick. Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, For someone who doesn't really know where they belong in the sports industry, like myself, what is the biggest advice you could give to them? I think it's, it's going to sound cheesy, but it actually is, you know, following your heart and your, your gut instinct. I mean, and that all comes from true learnings. It's actually going in there. It's going into the shitty job, rolling up your sleeves and thinking, okay, is this what I want to do? You know, if it's an entry level job in, I don't know if it's going to be in the staple center, I don't know what you're doing inside. If it's in the staple yeah. center and you have to do, you know, 40 hours, a flipping day, whatever it is, you know, just learn from it. And then just, I don't, I think to know what you really want to get out of it, it takes time. I mean, I'm 25. I'm still wondering, Jesus, you know, what do I, what's my North Star at the end of the day? I know I want to be in sports tech. That's what I want to be. But I only came to that, we'd say, epiphany that I, this is my North Star after flipping, you know, struggling through other jobs. I think it's, you know, unfortunately, it's not a perfect world. We're not in a utopia. And it's, it's just finding your feet. It takes time. And I just think just have that grit and resilience, soak it up. But the other thing is you just got to be, you got to ask the right questions too. There's no point asking questions. It's the right questions. And it's, you know, what are the, like even in a job, like, you know, what are the career opportunities inside there? It's not, you know, you get in the job and you're thinking, yeah, I can do this for two years. Like, you know, you should be thinking, how, how do I climb up there ASAP? What do mm-hmm. I have to do to expedite my journey? And it's, it's that Mamba mentality, really, at the end of the day, it's that killer instinct, but being personable. So I say, I know, I know it's bad. We're all looking for that cookie cutter success that magic bullet but it definitely is biding your time learning and it's just it's just knowing your worth in at the end of the day something's going to click and you're going to have it but everything we do is a journey i mean no matter what job you take don't don't worry about finding the job that the job is going to land someday light bulb mom's going to go off in your head you're going to think yeah this is it this is for me but that doesn't come without all this learning experience. I mean, look, Mark Zuckerberg, yeah, he's, I think he's the one in the seven billion that got the job he wanted to day mm-hmm. one from Golding. I mean, everyone has their struggles and strife. I just think it's it's all part of the journey. You look back on it now and think, fucking hell, that made me. And I think that's, for me, that's what it was for me. That's why I am today. I'm allowed to follow my dreams from, you know, all the learning experience I had from, you know, from struggling in that job, thinking, oh my God, am I ever going to get out of the sales job to getting into that, you know, that project manager job, loving it. Um, no, still knowing that's not what I want to do, but then, you know, getting that support, asking the right questions, like, you know, how do I start a business in the impending, you know, recession at the time? It's asking those right questions, but I think it's just, you will follow your heart once you learn. I think that's the, the key thing. I hope that makes sense. Oh, it does. Um, that just following your heart and it, you'll get there eventually. And uh, that I appreciate you saying that. Well, no, Patrick, yeah, there's yeah. no cookie cutter success. Yeah. I think that's the Gannon Baker and one of the 
geez, I used to be obsessed with Gannon Baker and his motivational videos, but there is one thing and I think it's, it's just powerful. There is no microwave success. There's nothing that you can put, you know, success into the microwave, say 30 seconds, and there you go. Oh, it's that grit, grind, and hard work, and you're going to get there eventually. Thank you very much. Patrick, I am very appreciative that you came on and talked to me. Uh, it was great. This is probably one of my favorite ones so far, if I'm being honest. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Thanks, Alex. Delighted I could help. And look, anytime yeah. I can do anything, let me and, know. And I will definitely keep reaching out to you when I, uh, you know, stay connected. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm. All right, uh, Patrick, you have a good day. I got to get to class. And uh, uh, see you around. I'll talk to you soon. Super, perfect. Alex, thanks for that. Stay yeah. safe. Yep. Bye. Bye. <laughs>